Gabe Newell. Facade, always smiling in every picture he took, even though for most of junior high, what Zach really wanted was torture. Torture by just about all the kids in his class at the American Heritage Academy outside of Hanover. Gabe Cordero was one of them. They had provided a lot of us, you know, making fun of them and leaving them out. Jacob says the kids began picking on Zach after he got juvenile high school. He says they started by mocking his limp and his snowball fight. People would, like, take his lunch, his sweatshirt, you know, like, do you have any idea how bad he felt? You know? He was just kind of quiet. He never really seemed too sad about it. Zach's parents say, at first, they were also dismissive of the jokes and slurs. I would say, well, you know, maybe they're just trying to be funny. You know, I don't maybe think that's either one of us fully mm-hmm. appreciated the hurricane that was going on inside of him. I think that they just called me trivial at a party once. Because of the way I talked. Even after Zach gave this speech at an arthritis fundraiser, the Jamesons say they still would have never guessed their 11-year-old son was in so much physical and emotional pain that he would actually consider killing himself. But he did consider it, and eventually even told me he would. And I, I, I felt the blood drain out of my face. Bullying that ends in suicide has become an all-too-familiar theme on the news although there are certainly lessons to be learned in those terrible endings. The more important lessons may lie in stories like this one. So the ending is far from tragic. <laughs> Today, Zach Jamison is 13, alive, and happy, thanks to a lot of good people who made some very smart decisions. First, his parents sought counseling for Zach, but they also encouraged him to get involved with a youth group at church to meet kids outside of school. Oh. Like Paul and Kayla. And at that time, that's all I needed was to be accepted. Yes. <laughs> I'm really glad I met him. <laughs> of course, he was still blackballed in school. But Zach says these new friendships gave him the courage to face that challenge anew. Yep. So when someone suggested he become manager of the cross country team, he went for it. It helped. It really did because I connected with a lot of friends. That's when he really felt wanted. He's ready to play. Mom. Thanks to school administrators who forced the issue, Jacob and Zach had a long heart to heart in the principal's office about how he felt and how it oppressed them if he really wasn't able to do anything. We were different from that day on. Mm-hmm. We were different kids, too. Really? Okay. At every school, there will always be the popular kid. No. no. And there will always be the outcast. But as Zach and Jacob proved, there will also always be common ground for those brave enough to walk. Steve Hartman, CBS News, Atlanta. Grace and peace to you. And Pastor Tony, I'm here to share a word from the Lord with us today um, that we can apply to modern day lives. Um, what we, what you just saw uh, was chosen. I went online and I saw probably 30 different um, little video segments, and, uh, and this is one that I thought would, would be a good one to share, because not only does it show uh, that bullying goes on, but it's, uh, it's a way to overcome that, and today's message uh, is about a bully. Uh, in the series of villains, Goliath is just a big bully, and David is the one who helps overcome the situation. So we'll look at uh, the historical context, we'll look at the biblical message, and we'll look at how we can apply that to our lives today. So let's look at uh, just a piece of that scripture from 1 Samuel chapter 17. The entire chapter is devoted to this David and Goliath story, but we'll just read this part. Let's uh, read together. A champion named Goliath, who was from Gath, came out of the Philistine camp. His height was six cubits and a span. He had a bronze helmet on his head and wore a coat of scale armor of bronze, weighing 5,000 shekels. On his legs, he wore bronze leaves, and a bronze javelin was slung on his back. His spear shaft was like a weaver's rod, and its iron point weighed 600 shekels. His shield bearer went ahead of him. Goliath stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why do you come out and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? 
Are you not the servants of Saul? Choose a man and have him come down to me. If he is able to fight and kill me, we will become your subjects. But if I overcome him and kill him, you will become our subjects and serve us. Then the Philistine said, This day I defy the armies of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight each other. On hearing the Philistines' words, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. This is the word of God from 3,000 years ago for you and I today and for all people. And we say, for that we say, thanks be to God. So we have, uh, we have David and we have Goliath. And this is a, a very familiar story, a uh, common story. And we even have, even if you've never heard the story, you've heard the phrase David and Goliath or a David and Goliath story. And uh, Indiana is famous for the David and Goliath story because the 1954 basketball team from Milan, Indiana, won the state championship. The little town with the little school. And we had a whole movie, Hoosiers, and this is basketball state. And we're getting ready to go into basketball time. And uh, so, so we have that whole David and Goliath mentality. And that just simply describes in our day and age. Uh, when someone who's weaker or smaller can overcome someone who's uh, bigger and greater. So we have that, and, and we have a culture of that David and Goliath, and we like to see those kinds of stories where someone overcomes the greatest of odds to uh, be a champion or a hero or uh, a victor. So uh, we have that, and in the whole area of, of bullying, we're going to focus on and apply this to bullies uh, at the end of the message. But uh, every, just about every school today has some kind of anti-bullying policy. This is what you're supposed to do if you see bullying or if you're being bullied. Uh, there's usually an anti-bullying week that goes on, and the student council or some students will, will do that. But this is, this is nothing, nothing new. And uh, some of you might be familiar with uh, a TV show that was going on a long time ago. I used to watch the reruns, and the theme song didn't have any words. And it went like this. Andy Griffith Show, right? I've seen every episode a hundred times. You know, it's one of the, it was on the reruns. It's one of the things I looked I looked at. Um, you know, there's probably a lot of people in this room that have never seen the Andy Griffith Show and don't know what it is, but they know what SpongeBob is. But uh, Ron Howard played Opie, and when Opie was like six or seven years old, there was a there was a bully, and there was a whole uh, whole show dedicated to Opie being bullied, and how Andy, his dad, who was also the sheriff, had to had to help Opie overcome this and stand up. So it's nothing new. It's in it's in every generation. There's always been bullies in the world, and Goliath is is one of those bullies. And a bully is very simply defined as someone who is uh, more powerful or weak than someone else who is using that to take advantage of or to intimidate, uh, maybe even be uh, physically abusive or maybe it's just emotional or psychological or mental, uh, but it's a difficult situation. And there are not just bullies in the school. There are bullies in the workplace. Uh, sometimes the, the boss is a bully and you have to deal with a boss who's a bully. There's bullies in the neighborhood, uh, there are always, there's always a bully around, uh, and one of the things is the bully never really identifies himself as a bully. So we also have to be mindful that sometimes you and I have the capacity to be that bully, and we want to be sure that we do not do that. So uh, here at Wesley Chapel, we're, we're followers of Jesus Christ. We want to be rooted in the love of Christ. Jesus was not a bully, and we're trying to be like Jesus and not be a bully. Uh, so we want to be rooted in the love of Christ. Our mission is to make disciples. So even in the mindset of a, a message like today, our ultimate goal is to uh, share the love of Jesus Christ to a bully, and hopefully that person will uh, come to know Jesus or in some way decide to have roots established in the love of Christ. And then we talk about growing in grace and what this Growing in grace means. Growing in grace means that, that we extend the grace of God to those who don't deserve uh, our, our free will and our, our love, our capacity. 
I mean, that's just not something, that's something that's a gift that we give to one another. We give the gift of grace by treating others better than they deserve. And we do that because God treated us better than we deserve. So when we see a bully that's maybe picking on somebody else, maybe they're picking on you, maybe they're picking on somebody else, there's another piece of Scripture all throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament, a theme, and, and that theme is to defend the vulnerable, defend the weak. And certainly uh, the bully situation with a bully, there's always someone being picked on. So, um, so I'm going to look at uh, David and Goliath. I'm going to show it as a pattern of a bully and a pattern of how to respond to a bully. And uh, also I want to give you some historical context because, uh, I mean, a lot of you already know the story, so hopefully you'll get something out of this that you haven't heard before. So the first thing I want to do is I want to compare David and Goliath to show that there is a clear advantage for Goliath and a clear disadvantage for David. David is a boy. He's a teenager. Uh, he is the youngest of eight boys. Jesse is his father. There are three of his older brothers on the battlefield. So Father Jesse says to David, go take some sandwiches or some food, whatever it happens to be, to your brothers on the battlefield. So here, David is not a part of this army. And he goes, he's been uh, watching the sheep, and he's come off the sheep field. And it's about, a, he has to walk, it's about 12 miles from where David is in the area of Bethlehem to the area of the battle is about 12 miles. So certainly uh, for that day and age, it's, it's uh, an easy walk. I know for you and me, that's, uh, you know, getting up and, you know, if you park on the other side of the parking lot here at the, at the Wesley Chapel, you're like, that's just such a long walk. I've heard that a couple of times. So they had to walk 12 miles, give the brothers some food. Uh, so he was a boy. Goliath was a giant. Uh, a six cubits would be about nine feet, nine inches high. He was a very big man. Uh, and he would be uh, a good three feet taller than anybody else that's here today. Uh, the giant in my, uh, in my family is my son-in-law. Uh, Joey played um, offensive lineman for the Louisville Cardinals. He's about, I don't know, 6'7", 6'8", uh, 350, 360. And when he comes over to dinner, there's a certain part of the dining room table that he can't sit because if he gets up, he, you know, breaks the light above him with his head. And so, uh, you know, he has, he has life as a giant, and he'll talk about the different places that he goes. And, and right now, uh, my daughter Anya and, and uh, Joey are on a cruise, and I'm thinking, I've never been on a cruise, but I've heard they don't make cruise ships for giants. It's just uh, not very good. So, uh, so anyway, I'll have uh, some good stories for you next week after that. So uh, here's Goliath. Goliath is three feet taller than most of the, the tallest people that I've met, and that's pretty tall. Uh, the, the advantage, disadvantage of weaponry. David is armed with a sling and a stone. Now, when uh, he goes to Saul, Saul, wants, Saul is the king. When he goes to Saul, Saul and volunteers to say, I'll fight Goliath. Uh, the first thing Saul wants to do is give him the armor. So, so David puts on the armor. It's clumsy. He says, I can't wear this. And Saul gives him his own personal armor. Now, I don't know, uh, I don't know about you, but uh, have you ever worn clothes that didn't fit? Maybe some of you are wearing that now. I, I don't know. Uh, maybe you need to go buy new clothes, or maybe you've lost a lot of weight, and so uh, so your clothes don't fit. But but he had clothes that didn't fit. It was cumbersome. It didn't feel comfortable. And when I was um, a freshman in high school, I played on the football team, and the the program listed me as 5'10", 102. But uh, 102 is with all my gear on and holding a couple of uh, quarters, rolls of quarters in my pocket. Uh, but being a freshman, I got kind of the last pick of the shoulder pads. And so the shoulder pads that they put on was shoulder pads that would have fit my son-in-law, Joey. I mean, I had these giant shoulder pads that I wore. And so uh, it wasn't real comfortable. It wasn't the right shoulder pads for me. So when, when David put on this armor fit, and he was walking around, and he said, I can't fight in this. This is too cumbersome. And, and there's a question that I ask myself, because having my own... Uh, shoulder pad incident, um, you know, when I got to be a, a sophomore, then I got to wear some shoulder pads that fit, and, the, you know, the freshmen got to wear the shoulder pads that didn't fit. But, but the question I ask myself when I read this story 
uh, even as a as a teenager, why didn't they give why didn't they give David armor that fit him? Well, I mean, they he tried on Saul. Saul was the, Saul, and it says Saul is a, was a head higher than all the other Israelites. So Saul was a was a big man. He was probably six four to six six. Uh, David, being a boy still, was probably in the five eight five ten. So obviously, armor that's made for six six Saul is not going to fit uh, a five eight boy. So why didn't they get him a different set of armor? Because there was no other set of armor. The entire Israelite army had one set of armor. So they didn't have another set. So he just wore the clothes on his back, the cloth, while David. David had, uh, or like Goliath, he had he had uh, armor. He had armor on his legs. He had armor on his chest. He had a javelin. Uh, he had um, a, a shield. And not only did he have a shield, but he had someone else to carry a shield. So he had the shield bearer carrying the shield in front of him. And here David is just with his sling and his stone. Uh, David was untested. He was an amateur. He'd never been in battle before. Uh, Goliath was a champion. Not only had he been in battle before, but he had won uh, many victories. He was a seasoned veteran going against an amateur. So, so there was a clear advantage for Goliath. There was a clear disadvantage for David. Now, I want to share uh, just a little on the map here of what was going on. And uh, this is about uh, between 1040 BC and 1000 BC, uh, more towards the 1040 BC. In the uh, the blue and the yellow, or the the northern and the southern kingdom of Israel, at the time of 1140 BC, these, this was one nation. It, it didn't split up until um, about 80 years later. So it was one nation, and Saul was its king. And then over in the bottom left hand corner, I've got a, a circle, a shaded area that uh, is the area of the Philistine army. Now, the history of the Israelites is. Uh, Father Abraham was called out of Ur, that's modern-day Iraq, uh, to go to the Promised Land, which is Israel. Uh, they were in the Promised Land for three generations, and then the famine hit, and the whole story of Joseph, they all end up in Egypt. They're in Egypt for 400 years. But they go back to the Promised Land after Moses takes them out of Egypt, and Jacob, not Jacob, uh, Joshua, Joshua takes them into this area, uh, that's in the yellow and the blue, and those 12 tribes settle there. And that's all happening around 1300 or so, uh, when that's going on. And at the same time that's going on, the Philistines are coming from the Asian Sea area, and they're coming into uh, the west side of this promised land area against the Sea of Galilee, or the, I'm sorry, the Mediterranean Sea. And so you have you have one group coming from the east and one group coming from the west. They're both settling at this, and they meet at this border. And there is a border dispute that's going on for about the next 300 years. Now, thank goodness, nothing like this ever happens in the Middle East today, right? No border disputes in the Middle East. You know, Syria and Israel, they never have a border dispute. Jordan, uh, well, I guess it's still going on, isn't it? So this is not uncommon. So it's a border dispute going on. Uh, we have the first little border dispute. The first uh, time that they're coming together, we find in the book of Judges. So we have the book of, of um, Joshua. Then we have the book of Judges. And there's a, a story in the book of Judges called Samson and Delilah. Anybody ever heard of Samson and Delilah? Well, when Samson picks up the um, jawbone of an ass, I like to say that. It's in the Bible. The jawbone of a donkey and uh, strikes uh, a thousand uh, Philistines. That's the border of war that's going on. It's the Philistines and the Israelites, and God has raised up Samson to be a deliverer uh, for the Israelite people to uh, fend off the Philistines who are trying to expand their border. So that's a little bit about uh, the Philistines. Whenever we see the Philistines, that's a little historical context. So from about 1250 until the time of David, we have this conflict going on. Another thing uh, I want to compare uh, pair with is um, these two countries and just share a little bit about, because not only was David at a disadvantage to Goliath, not only was Goliath 
had an advantage over David, the Philistines had a great advantage over the Israelites. You know, when, when we study the Bible and we look at the Israelites, we kind of see them as the modern uh, group, but that is really not so. They were, they were primitive. They were way behind the times. Uh, they were inland. They liked to be inland. They did not like water. Uh, matter of fact, when you, read, uh, when you read New Testament, a little bit of Old Testament, when you read that any reference to water, it's evil. Remember when uh, Jesus goes over the Sea of Galilee uh, and, with the, and, the, and the storm comes up? Bad things happen on bodies of water. There was no Israeli navy, nor did they want one. They didn't want to be on the water at all. Uh, the Philistines, they were a seaport nation. They had been a seaport group of people uh, in the Asian uh, Aegean Sea, which is Greece, uh, modern-day Turkey, that little area. So they were, they were seafaring, and they had advanced naval technology. Uh, Israel had a brand-new government. Uh, Saul was the first king. Brand-new government. It, was, it wasn't organized. I mean, it basically, Saul was the king. There was no capital city. And you say, well, what about Jerusalem? Well, Jerusalem isn't the capital until David becomes king. Uh, Forty years after Saul uh, has become king, so uh, there's no, there's, there's really the government's pretty primitive. Uh, Philistine had a very advanced government; they were democratic. Uh, they had borrowed the model of the Greeks, the city-state model. So when you studied, I know it's a long time since high school. Athens, Sparta, Corinth; those were Greek city-states. They had their own government. They were had representatives in that government. And so they brought that model and used five cities that, that was mentioned. Five cities in Philistine uh, were five independent city-state governments who came together and formed an alliance called the Philistine State. Very advanced for that time. Uh, Israel, one suit of armor. That was it. So there's a disadvantage there. The, uh, the Israelites had one set of armor. The king had that set of armor. The Philistines were a trained army. There was a lot of armor in that. And uh, we know that, you know, these three brothers of David, they weren't trained. They weren't military people. They were shepherds. And so when the Philistines were on the border, uh, threatening the border of Israel, and Saul called up an army, he, uh, the people that came to the army were the field hands and the shepherds. So they weren't trained. They weren't equipped. They didn't have anything to protect themselves. Uh, they didn't have much in the way of weaponry, and they were going against the Philistine trained army. In some ways, by, by Goliath coming out and saying, send one champion among you to fight me, was really kind of nice uh, to the Israelites because that Israelite army didn't stand a chance against the Philistine army when we look at the way uh, an army would handle itself, a battle would, would have out. Now, uh, the, the bronze and iron is, tells us that the Philistines had advanced technology. So what we're seeing here is they had advanced military. They had advanced uh, government. They had advanced organization. They had advanced technology. What we read in 1 Samuel 17, I know it's a very small part, but it gives us a very big clue. At the end of Goliath's javelin, was a spear tip, and the spear tip was made of iron. This is the era where the, the Bronze Age is giving way to the Iron Age. It's, in, it's advanced technology. The Philistines have access to the advanced technology of iron. Where did that advanced technology of iron come from? It came from Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey. It came from the area. They brought it with them. Israelites had had very little access to iron, even if they knew what, what this particular kind of iron was. So, uh, there was only one thing that the Israelites had an advantage. And their only advantage was they worshipped the one true God, the God Yahweh. We get the word Yahweh from Exodus chapter 3. When Moses goes to the, the burning bush, the, bur the bush that is on fire but is not consumed, and God speaks out of that burning bush and says, Go set my people free. Moses asked God this question. When I go to Pharaoh, 
who shall I tell Pharaoh has sent me? He's asking God, what's your name? And John says, I am who I am, which also means I was who I was and I will be who I will be. In, in the I am sentence, God is saying that he is the one who was, he is the one who is, he is the one who will always be. And so this is the God that Israel uh, worshipped, and it's the God that David, uh, the one who says David was a man after God's own heart, this is the God whose, day, whose heart David was after. Uh, the Philistine god was Dagon. It was kind of a monster-looking dude uh, with a lot of scales. Looked like a, the backside looked like a fish. The front side kind of looked like a wolf. And it was the, the um, god of multiplication. So they go and they worship. And basically, God, please give me uh, a good harvest. Give me lots of kids. Uh, give me, uh, let, you know, if I'm going fishing, let me get a lot of fish. If I have cattle, you know, let my cattle multiply. It's the god of multiplication. So there's a, a few pieces about that. So, uh, and I go through all that one to give you some background to show you the Israel-Philistine conflict, but to really show you that there's a huge disadvantage. And so I'm going to take that, and what, I'm, what we're going to do with that is we're going to apply it to modern day situation. We're going to apply it to this. Um, how many of you work in schools in any capacity, or are a student in a school? So you, you're in a school, you work in a school, and so you, you deal with this annually. You deal with this. Um, you've got signs in the school that says this is what you do. Before, uh, before there were signs in the school about what to do about bullies, we had scripture. And we can see from what David did, there's three things that David does that we can see. This is how we respond to a bully, whether that bully's in school, whether that bully's in the neighborhood, whether that bully's at, at your work site. Uh, or maybe a bully in your family. And sometimes the bully is someone close to you. I mean, there are, we have domestic situations where uh, one of the spouses is a bully, taking advantage of power and intimidation over the other spouse. I mean, we deal with that all the time in, in spouse abuse. So bullies are across the board. And here we have three things that I want to share with you from Scripture, how to apply. The first thing is go to someone in authority. That's what David did. David went to Saul. Saul was the king. He went to Saul. And that's uh, a lot of the policies that we have. If you see bullying or you're being bullied, you go to a teacher, you go to an assistant principal, you go to a counselor, you go to someone in authority that can respond to the bullying that's going on. I know when it's in the work environment and then your boss is the bully, that makes it a little tougher. Do you go to your boss's boss? I mean, you risk losing your job. But this is the model that Scripture has for us. You go to someone in authority. Uh, the second thing that we see that David does is David speaks truth. That's so important. Uh, in, the, in the model that we saw today, in the, in the video that we saw, um, Zach, who's the one being bullied, Zach goes to someone in authority. He goes to his parents. His parents are in authority over him. And he speaks truth. And what do the parents do with that truth? Their own confession is they dismiss it. Oh, maybe they're just joking around. Maybe they're just having fun. And it's very important that if you're someone in authority and, and someone comes to you and shares with you a situation of being bullied, that one, you don't dismiss it, make it less than what it is. And the other side of that is don't make a mountain out of a molehill. Don't make it more than what it is. You speak truth and you discern truth. So David spoke truth. He spoke truth to Saul and he spoke truth to Goliath in that situation. And we, and we have a very interesting piece that the one in authority should be the one who's taking action. So if you're a person in authority and you have this situation in front of you, then it's your responsibility to take action with the information that you've been given. Saul did not take action. Saul was the one in authority. Uh, Saul was the king. David was a boy. David went to Saul, who was the king. What action did Saul take? I wrote, he was silent. The scripture says he cowered in fear. He cowered in fear. Saul did not stand up for what is right. Saul did not speak truth. Saul did not take action. And here Saul is the king. And, and it says in scripture that 
Saul was a head higher, a head taller than all the other people in Israel. So who was the champion that should have challenged Goliath? It should have been Saul. And if Saul, who has the armor, who has the training, who has the position of authority, who is the leader of the nation, if, if Saul is not willing to stand up against Goliath, who's next in line? Someone who's a foot shorter. Someone who's a shepherd. Someone who's not trained. No, it should have been Saul who took action. But if action is not taken, taken, then David was willing to take action, regardless of his size and stature, regardless of all the situation, regardless of the disadvantage that he had against Goliath, the disadvantage that the Israelites had against the Philistines. There really is, I mean, when you talk about a David and Goliath story, the David and Goliath story is the greatest David and Goliath story, right? Because that's the David and Goliath story. All other stories compare to this story because it is such a disadvantage that David goes up against. So against all odds, David is willing to take action. Picks up five stones, puts one in sling, he confronts Goliath, they have a conversation, something like, I'm going to feed your bones to the birds, uh, and that kind of thing. Uh, So that back and forth banter goes on. Here's Goliath with his armor, with his javelin, with the iron tip, with the shield there in front of him. uh, David takes one of the stones, puts it in a sling, and he had said prior to confronting David, he said, when I'm with the sheep, I've killed a bear and I've killed a lion. And certainly, God will give this giant into my hand. And so he throws a stone, hits him in the head, goes over, takes Goliath's sword, and chops off his head. Now, I'm not sure if we're sure we should apply that particular action to our circumstances today. So please don't hear me saying I've given you permission to chop off someone's head. We do know that goes on in the world today, and it's horrendous, it's horrible, it's an act of hatred. But David took action, and we can take action. We can take action against a bully, whether it's a bully at our school or a bully at the terrorist or on a national level or an international level. We are to take action against the bully. And as a Christian, our ultimate goal is to win the bully or to love the bully to Jesus Christ. But we are also to defend those who are weak. We're to defend those who um, are at a disadvantage. So if we see someone being bullied, we're to stand up for that person. And we're to speak truth to the bully, to say, this isn't right. We're supposed to come along the side, the one who's being bullied, and said, you know, we are partners in this together. When, when we come to be a member, if, you, if you're a member or if you ever like to be a member of Wesley Chapel, we ask three questions. The first question I ask is, do you repent of your sin and do you promise to resist evil according to the grace that's given to you? So if you're a member, you've already said yes to that. You've already said yes that you're willing to resist evil with the grace that's given to you. So bullying is evil. And so what are we doing about that? What are you being called to do about that? So go to the authority, speak truth, take action. Another thing I want you to do if you're a parent or a grandparent, I want you to have a conversation with your teenager or your young adult or your elementary child. And just because a lot of times bullying's going on, you'll never know it. So you need to initiate the conversation. So uh, so this week was guy week, all right? Uh, my wife, Rhonda, took the girls. They're out in Arizona. They're having a great time. And so it's just Caleb and me, a 13-year-old. And so, you know, I plan to do a couple of guy things that, that we did together. And so instead of going and seeing, uh, you know, a Disney movie that we might go see with, uh, with my youngest daughter, we went to see The Scorch Trials, good shoot 'em up movie for teenagers, part of the Maze Runner series. And uh, then we ate at Five Guys. We got good greasy burgers. I walked, before I walked in to get those burgers, and he'd never been before, and I've been wanting to take him for a long time. I said, now when I'm 75 and I had a heart attack, you're going to remember this day. Uh, so, uh, so he loved it and his, you know, he's there eating his cheeseburger and I said, how you like it? He says, man, we need to come here every time mom goes out of town. One of the conversations I had with him, mindful of the message, 
uh, I said, uh, I said, Caleb, uh, have you ever been bullied? He just laughed at me. He's, he's the biggest kid on the football team. Um, so, no, he hadn't been bullied. I said, Caleb, have you ever bullied anyone else? He says, no, Dad. But I know I've, I've had testimony from others that have said Caleb is one who kind of with the underdog, helps out those who uh, maybe are at a disadvantage in some sort of way. And so, uh, so I just said, you know, if you see bullying going on, I want you to be willing to stand up for the one who's bullied and, you know, go tell somebody if you need to. 30-second conversation is about the longest that he and I have together. You know, we're just two guys in a car in uh, three sentences in 30 seconds. But that's an, a very effective 30 seconds for you to have a conversation with your kids and your grandkids. How do they know where you stand? How do you know? How do they know where you want, uh, where you want, what you want them to do? Unless you share little things like that along the way, and it's biblical. We have the we have the pattern from David. David spoke truth. David went to authority. David took action. So let us model our lives after the biblical pattern that's set for us today. Now, the prayer I have for us, I've printed off, uh, and I want to uh, want us to read this prayer together. So let us pray. O God of truth and grace, help us to make disciples to transform the world. May we protect the vulnerable and give them safety. May we confront bullies, break down the barriers of evil, and show the love of Christ in such a way that bullies become believers. Forgive us when we have been in a position of strength and have used it to intimidate others. 